Good evening. My name is Andrew Copson. I'm Chief Executive of Humanists UK, and I'm delighted to welcome you this evening to our annual Rosalind Franklin Lecture. This is Humanists UK's annual lecture to mark International Women's Day. Former speakers have included Professor Dame Anne Glover, Professor Sarah Jane Blakemore, Angela Saini, Kathy Newman, and Professor Francesca Stavrakopoulou. And the series chair is the multi-award winning journalist Samira Ahmed, to whom I'm going to hand over in just a moment. The hashtag for tonight's lecture is hashtag Franklin Lecture. I'm delighted to say we have almost 2,000 people with us tonight, making us the largest Franklin Lecture to date. And no wonder, no issue has so gripped the whole world like COVID-19, and few may turn out to be more central to our escape from this nightmare than today's speaker. I'll hand over straight away now to Samira Ahmed to introduce her. Samira Ahmed is a multi-award winning journalist and broadcaster with a special focus on culture, politics and social change. She won Audio Broadcaster of the Year uh, just last year at the British Press Guild Awards for her work as a presenter of Front Row on Radio 4 and her podcast, How I Found My Voice. She's the chair of the Rosalind Franklin Lecture and a long-term friend of Humanist UK. I'm delighted to hand over to her uh, to preside over this evening, Samira. Andrew, thank you so much. And welcome to all of you from all around the world. Um, I always say to Andrew, I never see a turnout for events as I do uh, for Humanists UK. So thrilled to welcome you. And we all know this is a particularly monumental lecture. Um, Marking International Women's Day, this lecture series explores and celebrates the contributions of women towards the promotion and advancement of aspects of humanism in the UK and around the world. The Rosalind Franklin Medalist has made a significant contribution in one of these fields. The lecture and the medal are named, of course, for Rosalind Franklin, humanist and scientist, whose contribution to science for many years went unacknowledged on account of her sex and who is today rightly celebrated. We do want you to ask questions. There'll be lots of time to put them um, to our speaker um, a little bit later. Don't submit them yet because it can be distracting, but there is a Q&A tab. I'm sure many of you are used to it now on Zoom calls. And so save up your questions. And, and when we uh, finish the lecture and I start to um, ask a couple of questions of my own, that's the moment to start submitting them. And um, we'll take them as uh, many as we can. Put your name if you want me to say who you are and give you a, a name call when I um, use it. Just before I introduce Sarah, uh, I'll take a moment to remind you again that the hashtag for tonight is hashtag Franklin Lecture. So do feel free to um, tweet about it and share it on social media. So our lecturer tonight is Professor Sarah Gilbert, Professor of Vaccinology in the Nuffield Department of Medicine at the University of Oxford. She completed her undergraduate studies at the University of East Anglia and her doctoral degree at the University of Hull. Following four years as a research scientist at the biopharmaceutical company Delta Biotechnology, she joined Oxford University in 1994 and became part of the Jenner Institute there when it was founded in 2005. Her chief research interest is the development of viral vectored vaccines that uh, work by, in, by inducing strong and protective T and B cell responses. And she works on vaccines from many different emerging pathogens, including influenza, MERS, Lassa, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, and SARS. Working with colleagues in the Jenner Institute Research Labs, the Clinical Biomanufacturing Facility, and the Center for Clinical Vaccinology and Tropical Medicine, all situated on the old road campus in Oxford, she's able to take novel vaccines from design through to clinical development, with a particular interest in the rapid transfer of vaccines into manufacturing and first in human trials. And Lord knows rapid transfer and the rapid development of vaccine is one of the amazing stories of this past year. She is the Oxford project leader um, for the key vaccine that's been developed against the novel coronavirus. It's been used to vaccinate millions of British adults in the first weeks of the national vaccine rollout. I'm thrilled to welcome the Rosalind Franklin lecturer tonight, Professor Sarah Gilbert. Thank you very much for the introduction, Samira. So I'm going to get straight into my talk and I'm going to give you a bit of background leading up to what I did uh, before 2020 uh, to try to set the scene a bit so you can maybe see how we were able to go so fast when we got to 2020 and, and really needed to make a rapid response. So first I want to start off by reminding you that emerging infectious diseases have to come from somewhere. They don't just spring up fully formed from nowhere. Um, most of the time, they're actually present in different livestock species. And most of the time, they stay in those livestock species or wildlife 
um, and we don't really notice what's going on. There's, there's actually an awful lot of viruses out there that we probably don't even know about yet, and they don't need to worry us because they, they stay with the species that they normally infect. But occasionally we get what we call a spillover. So occasionally um, a virus will move from, say, a bat into a camel, and then um, possibly people who are in contact with the camel gets infected. You might have influenza viruses moving into pigs, moving into um, domestic poultry. And then um, that means that we're more likely to be exposed to the virus. So often uh, the, the turkey or the duck isn't the original source of, of the new virus that starts to cause infections in human, but it gets amplified in that intermediate host. And then because people keep the, the turkeys or the ducks and they, they slaughter them and they get exposed to the, the fluids from the animal, then they can get infected. So occasionally what we do see is viruses um, starting to infect humans when they hadn't been infected humans before. Now, one of these is Ebola. And um, you may remember the 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa. It may be something you've forgotten about now. It was something that I followed in the news every day, as, as we did with the COVID outbreak last year. We were following what was going on in West Africa with Ebola in 2014. This actually um, is another viral disease. It's a hemorrhagic fever. It causes uh, a lot of fever and a lot of bleeding, blood loss, high fatality rate. and um, in 2014, this virus, which is normally found in bats, started to infect people. In fact, it probably first happened in 2013, this particular outbreak. Now, this particular virus has been known about since 1976. 2014 wasn't certainly the first time it had ever caused outbreaks in people. But most of the outbreaks before had been in quite isolated rural areas where people were in closer proximity to bats. And they tended to have been dealt with fairly quickly by the tried and tested methods of contact tracing and quarantine. So finding out if somebody is ill, who they've been in contact with, and making sure that those people quarantine. And when this was involving fairly small numbers of people in rural areas that could, and they could be well separated, that was an effective method of controlling the disease. But what happened in 2014 was that the disease slowly spread and um, it rumbled on and then it moved into cities and then we had high population density, lots of people being infected um, quickly, more difficult to do the contact tracing and it grew into an outbreak which spread across three countries in Guinea, in Sierra Leone and in Liberia. And we started to see cases popping up in small numbers in other countries when people traveled. Now these borders between the different countries are quite porous, people go back and forward, and you really have to treat the whole outbreak area as one. And there was no vaccine. Um, there had been work in vaccine development done mainly in the US uh, it, as part of a biodefense program, because this is such a scary virus that uh, there had been concern about it being used as a weapon. And so uh, vaccine development had happened so that if that was to take place, we might have some possibility of um, defending people against it. But this vaccine, which was still at quite an early stage of development, wasn't being used in West Africa. And gradually the case numbers grew. These different colors represent the different countries. Most of the cases in Liberia, case numbers increasing rapidly through 2014. This was really getting out of control and that the old methods of containing the outbreak just weren't working. So there were two vaccines that had gone some way in vaccine development. And uh, with myself uh, and other colleagues at Oxford, we got involved in a consortium to try to really accelerate the vaccine where, uh, that had been developed by a company called Akiris. They were using um, a viral vector vaccine. It was a, an adenovirus that normally circulates among chimpanzees rather than humans. That means humans don't already have antibodies to it, which is useful. And they'd use this to make a vaccine against Ebola. And we'd worked with the company on some malaria vaccine development and, um, and vaccine development against other diseases using the, the, the chimpanzee adenovirus or CHAD3 vaccine platform. But in 2014, uh, we got together with a, a group of other people to try to really accelerate vaccine development for this. It had been tested in animals previously. A batch had been manufactured, ready to go into clinical trials in humans. It hadn't been put into the vials, ready to initiate that trial. And that's where things had stopped. So 
we were asked to help get this uh, vaccine put into the vials, tested, do the applications to start a clinical trial. And we knew we could do that very rapidly in Oxford. And our plan was to do a phase one trial of this new vaccine against Ebola in Oxford, um, starting in the middle of September with 60 volunteers. That would provide data on the, the safety and the immune responses coming from the vaccine, which would then go into a, a phase one study in Mali. Now, this is another West African country. It was right next to the outbreak area, but they didn't have the outbreak in Mali. However, the healthcare workers um, were happy to volunteer to take part in the trial because if it did spread into Mali, they would be the ones who would be needing to respond to the outbreak. And in parallel with doing these trials, manufacturing of a larger batch, 20,000 doses, was set up. So the objective was to get safety data from testing in 140 people in the UK and in Mali, particularly in healthcare workers, and seeing if the immune responses that were generated were similar to the levels that had been previously used to protect monkeys when the, the monkey studies had been done. And that was then expected to lead into a decision whether to carry on with the vaccine development and do a larger phase three trial to test if the vaccine was effective. Does it stop people getting Ebola infection? And we thought that that might be possible to start by December of 2014, um, again, mainly targeting the healthcare workers who, um, as with COVID, were becoming infected in the course of their work and also could then spread the disease to their family and to other patients. And so they were the most important uh, population to target first with vaccination. So this was a very rapid um, timeline for that clinical trial. Um, the grant application was submitted to the Wellcome Trust who actually helped write it rather unusually um, on the 14th of August. And that funding was awarded um, only 12 days later. Uh, it can, in normal times, take anything up to a year or even 18 months to get funding for a project of this nature. But this was done very rapidly because of the need to move quickly. The vaccine had been made. It was a bulk product in a large quantity, but it needed to be put into the individual vaccine vials before it could be used in the clinical trial. That was done. Uh, the application to the MHRA was submitted so that uh, the trial could um, legally take place and there was an ethical application as well. We need both regulatory approval from the MHRA and approval from an ethical committee to be able to start um, a new clinical trial. Both of these were prioritised and went very quickly. The vaccine was delivered, the labels were put on. We had these very complicated labels for vaccines being used in the clinical trial. It tells you a lot of information about what's in there. Um, and finally, a contract was signed for the funding for the trial. And on the 17th of September, the first person in Oxford was vaccinated. And by the 18th of November, 60 people in Oxford had been vaccinated and the data was being provided to Mali so that the clinical trial could start there. Now, while this was going on, uh, the outbreak was still continuing and um, we were starting to see over time the numbers of cases were declining as we got through to the end of 2014 and into 2015. Although we did our phase one trial, we got very good safety data, we showed the immune response of the vaccine, um, and then the trial in Mali started, there was then a delay over the plans for the phase three trial to take place in West Africa. There was discussion about whether a placebo controlled trial, which is the gold standard for testing vaccines, was ethical because this is a disease with such a high fatality rate. Um, what should be the best design of the trial? While those discussions were happening, the numbers of cases were declining. And in the end of two vaccines that went into early clinical development, only one of them was tested in an efficacy trial. And it wasn't the one that we'd worked on, unfortunately for us. Um, it was a vaccine which was shown to have very high efficacy. So it was a great success. The difficulty with it, with it is that it requires really low temperature storage, so minus 70 degrees storage. And that's very difficult to use a vaccine that needs such low temperature storage in West Africa, where the ambient temperature is very high. But it wasn't possible to go on and test the vaccine that we'd worked on because by this time the outbreak had been contained and this wasn't due to use of the vaccine it was due to just persisting with the contact tracing and quarantine method however as a, as a result of this the world did have a first ebola vaccine that was licensed then for emergency use another one has been uh, developed subsequently but although our early vaccine testing had gone very quickly 
it then just ground to a halt when we had to talk about how to get into vaccine efficacy testing. So that, that was a learning for those of us who are looking to do rapid vaccine development, that you need to have all parts of the plan to test the vaccine ready to move quickly. It's not enough to do a phase one trial and say, yes, this vaccine's safe and we get a good immune response. You need to work out how you're going to test if the vaccine is effective and be ready to do that really fast. And that kind of thinking was behind what we did in 2020. So let me tell you a bit about the, the technology we use, the way we make our vaccine. And this is a, a cartoon on the right hand side here of an adenovirus. So there are lots of different adenoviruses. Most mammalian species will have adenoviruses that will infect them and some can infect more than one. Uh, we use an adenovirus uh, that's also normally found in chimpanzees rather than humans. It's not the same one as in the Ebola vaccine trial. It's one that we developed in Oxford. Um, but the fact that it doesn't circulate in humans normally and cause respiratory tract infections as adenoviruses do means that uh, we don't have any antibodies to it. Now there are lots of closely related adenoviruses that do infect humans. They cause a cold. We don't generally know that we have an adenovirus infection. We just know that we have a cold and it's a, a fairly mild illness, but we get infected with adenoviruses all the time. It's, it's quite a common thing to happen to us in the winter. And those are adenoviruses that have all of their genes intact and they can spread through the body and cause an infection. But we don't want that to happen with our vaccine. So what we've done is removed some of the genes from the adenovirus. And then what we do is add in a gene that codes for, that provides the instructions for the extra piece of protein that we want to make. And in the case of NCOV-19, it's the spike protein from the coronavirus. So we add DNA that gives the instructions to make the coronavirus spike protein into our adenovirus vector. And having taken out some genes that mean that the adenovirus can't spread through the body after, after we use it to vaccinate somebody, it's replication deficient. Um, and we've been using this approach for a while, um, using the Chadox one that we developed um, since um, we've had uh, more than 330 subjects vaccinated in clinical trials with different antigens added into it before we started the, um, the SARS-CoV-2 trials. Uh, these were um, different antigens and I'll tell you about some of them. But more broadly, simian adenoviruses, the CHADs have been used in, in over 6,000 people um, in inference in Africa, in malaria vaccine trials and in older people in the UK in flu vaccine trials. And we saw that we got a consistent safety profile and strong immune responses after one dose. And importantly, for the COVID vaccine development, I'd also started working on a trial against another coronavirus, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And I'll again tell you a bit more about that later. So this is a cartoon of the virus, and it, it looks quite a scary thing. It's not really in different colours. This is just to help you see the different parts of the virus. And I was um, reading something recently about a GP who had been saying that he'd been talking to one of the members of his staff at his practice, um, and this, this person didn't want to take the, the COVID vaccine. And he had quite a long conversation with this member of his staff. And at the end of it um, said that, well, she just felt that it was something foreign and she didn't want something foreign in her body. And, and that was that. Uh, and my response to that is, well, of course it's foreign. Otherwise it wouldn't work as a vaccine. We have a really complex and highly evolved immune system. And what the immune system does is continually scan the body for something that shouldn't be there. So we call it distinguishing between self and non-self. So when the immune system's working properly, it doesn't attack our own bodies. That can happen in autoimmune disease, but when it's working properly, that doesn't happen. What it's doing is looking for something that's not us, looking for something that's foreign. And when it does, it will spring into action. It will start to make antibodies. It will start to make T cells and deal with that invader. That's the job of the immune system. Um, now, when we make a vaccine, we want to stimulate the immune system in that way, but we want to do it in a way that's safe. So I told you that this adenovirus vector that we use can't spread through the body. We use it because it carries the gene for the coronavirus spike protein into the body when we inject it into somebody's muscle. It goes inside their cells, as an adenovirus normally will do, and it starts to make large quantities of that spike protein, and then it stops. It can't go any further. If we don't make any immune response to it, it still can't go any further. It's disabled, it can't spread, it can't do us any harm. 
it will induce an immune response and that immune response can give us some side effects it can give us headache fever chills sometimes pain at the injection site these are all quite short-lived things that can happen after vaccination because the immune response is developing and as a result of that we get left with an immune memory and that means that if we then encounter in this case the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus, we've already got the immune memory that suddenly activates and springs into action and protects us against that coronavirus infection. Now, any viral infection is something foreign coming into the body. Any bacterial or parasitic infection is something foreign. And what our immune system does is find the things that are foreign and destroy them. And we train the immune system to do that by using a vaccine. And I think it's a bit like if we're training our muscles uh, if we're running or if we're weightlifting, uh, we are training the muscles to be bigger, to be stronger. We can have some temporary soreness of the muscles, but as a result of the training, the muscles will grow, uh, they'll become more effective, and then we're better able to do the task that we want to do. It's a bit like that with a vaccine. We're using it to train the immune system in a controlled and in a safe way without giving somebody a real infection. So for me, saying that you don't want to have a vaccine and you'd rather take your chances with the viral infection itself is a bit like signing up to run a marathon and then not doing the training for it. And you're really going to feel um, how difficult and stressful it is when you actually start to run that marathon if you haven't prepared, if you haven't done the training. So the vaccine is giving your immune system the training it's laying down that immune memory so we can then respond. And in order to do that, it has to be something that's foreign to the body. But it's not there for very long. It's there for a few days. It does its job. And then the immune memory is there uh, and the vaccine has left the body. So we had started developing this Chadox-1 vaccine vector, as we call it, a way of being able to add different genes from different pathogens, particularly virus, viruses into it so that we can make vaccines against all of these different pathogens that are shown on the left hand side of this slide. And these, these are um, identified by the WHO as being um, pathogens, the priority pathogens that we don't have vaccines against, but they do cause outbreaks. And I'm going to talk a bit about some of these, but our approach was to start making vaccines against all of them, testing them in the lab to see if we get the immune response could we get neutralizing antibodies, gradually testing them in animals to see if they will protect animals against particular infections, and then getting the funding to manufacture them in the, in the very highly controlled way that we need to do before we can start clinical trials, and then start the clinical development. And in the years between 2015 and 2020, we've been gradually adding ticks to this slide across the team in the General Institute and testing more and more of these vaccines, all using the same technology. And because it's all based on the same technology, it means we can work very efficiently. We're not starting from scratch every time, so we can go really very quickly. So one of the diseases that we've worked on is Rift Valley fever virus. And this is, um, was first identified in the Rift Valley in Kenya. It's now spread all over Africa. It's spread into the Middle East as well. It's a virus that infects um, sheep, cattle and goats and can also infect camels. In young animals, it has a high mortality rate, not so much in the older animals, uh, but it also causes what's known as abortion storms. So if it goes through a flock of sheep where the sheep are pregnant, anything up to 90% of them can lose their lambs. And this is really devastating for the farmer because it means there's not going to be um, a crop of lambs born that year. Humans can get infected with the virus as well. Um, the case fatality rate, the, the percentage that tend to die after being infected is about 30%, but those who recover can have lasting effects after the vaccine. The fact that camels can get infected because they're used for transport, they travel long distances, they can spread the outbreak between different areas, and it's transmitted by multiple different mosquito species, some of which can um, lay eggs which stay in the ground if it's dry for many years. The eggs hatch and uh, the grass grows and livestock come and start to feed on the grass and the mosquitoes that have hatched from the eggs are already infected with the Rift Valley fever virus and they start feeding on the livestock who get infected and then they can infect people who are looking after the livestock. So it's because of that, it's something that can crop up um, in an area where there hasn't been any of this disease for many years and then all of a sudden there's an outbreak. 
So uh, my colleague George Warimwe, who is based in Kenya, started testing Chadox-1 against a Rift Valley fever virus. Um, and he tested it in cattle, in sheep, and in goats. Now there is a licensed vaccine against Rift Valley fever. It's called the smith vaccine. This is derived from Rift Valley fever virus itself. And it's quite a good vaccine, but it's not perfect. Um, it has some safety features that mean it's, it um, is sometimes, it's not the kind of vaccine you'd want to use in people. Um, and also it's not completely effective. So these are what's called kaplan meyer plots, and I've got a few of these. So I'll just explain that this is what we're looking at here is animals that have been vaccinated have then been deliberately infected with the Rift Valley fever virus. And we're looking at what happens to them in the 14 days after that's happened. And we're looking to see how many of them fail to have the virus still in their blood. Uh, so obviously they all start off without virus in their blood, but in the animals that have been given a placebo vaccine, in the cattle by three days after infecting them, they all have virus in their blood. In the cattle that received the um, Chadox-1 Rift Valley fever vaccine, either with or without an adjuvant, none of them developed viremia. And in the cattle who have the licensed vaccine, the smith burn vaccine, um, about 78% of them are protected. So better efficacy in, in the cattle with the Chadox-1 vectored vaccine, um, both vaccines are fully effective in sheep, whereas the control animals get infected. And again, in goats, uh, the smith burn vaccine is quite good, but not completely effective, whereas the Chalux-1 Rift vaccine is completely effective. So in these three species, which is the major um, sources of the virus from which people get infected, this vaccine works very well. Uh, and that vaccine is now going into clinical development that's been delayed somewhat because of the pandemic. So the idea would be to have a vaccine against Rift Valley fever virus that you can use to immunize the livestock and that protects people from getting infected because they won't get exposed, but also to have a version of the vaccine that you would use to protect humans. So particularly the people who have to go and investigate outbreaks and the farmers who are working with the livestock could be protected against Rift Valley fever virus. Uh, and if, the out, if there's an outbreak that starts to spread, you could use the vaccine more widely. And another, vac uh, another virus that we should pay attention to is Nipah virus. This is highly pathogenic and it occasionally causes usually quite small outbreaks in Asia. Um, it was first identified in 1998, so not very long ago, um, where it was found to infect pigs. And then humans got infected by being exposed to infected pigs. It's actually uh, found in fruit bats, and in Bangladesh, where most of the cases have been, people get infected because the fruit bats come to drink the date palm sap that's being collected from the, from the date palms. Um, they collect, they tap the trees and collect the sap. It's a sweet and sticky drink, um, which people drink raw. And the bats like to come and get into the pots where the sap's being collected and they contaminate the pots if they're infected with Nipah virus. Then when people drink the date palm sap, uh, that a bat has contaminated, they can get infected. So the virus can either go directly into a human or via a pig and into a human. And it's a very similar virus to a uh, Hendra virus. And this was first identified in Australia in 1994, um, infecting horses. But uh, from horses, it can spread to humans. And again, um, uh, bats uh, form the reservoir. So it's mainly in the bats it doesn't tend to spread directly from bats to people. There's rarely contact between them. But if the bats can infect the horses, then people working with the horses can get infected from the horses. Um, and there have been um, seven human cases known about and four deaths from Hendra virus. Uh, in 2015, a vaccine was registered uh, in Australia for use in horses. Uh, this is quite a simple, straightforward vaccine, but it's highly effective. So in Australia, by vaccinating the horses against Hendra virus, it's prevented people from being exposed and so people aren't infected. So we don't actually need a human vaccine against Hendra virus. If we protect the horses well enough, and because they are valuable animals, um, this is something that has happened, then people don't get exposed to Hendra virus. But Nipah virus, uh, we don't have a vaccine against. But because it's a very similar virus to Hendra, if you can make a vaccine against Hendra, it will be possible to make a vaccine against Nipah. So we took the same approach. We took the, the DNA, the instructions, 
to encode uh, the, the protein that's found on the surface of Nipah virus, and we put it into Chadox-1. And we immunized some hamsters, and we looked at their neutralizing antibody titers. So here um, in the blue spots, this is the antibodies developing after one dose and after two doses of the vaccine. Um, whereas we don't see these antibodies developing in the animals who just have a saline control or uh, an adenovirus which expresses a different antigen, but not the Nipah antigen. And then when these animals are deliberately exposed to Nipah virus, here's the, the plot again. So the animals that have received in the red and the blue, either two, one or two doses of Chadox-1 Nipah, uh, they all survive. Whereas the ones that have the control vaccines, they, they all succumb to the infection by about nine days after the infection. And if we look at their weight, uh, the vaccinated animals happily, steadily increase their weight, whereas the ones that have had the control vaccines, uh, they lose weight very rapidly. So this is very protective in hamsters, which is a model that we use for um, Nipah vaccine development. And this is now in development to be tested as a vaccine for humans so that we can have a stockpile um, so that healthcare workers in Bangladesh, where most of the cases occur, can be protected. Um, but we need to take this vaccine through all the development stages. And prior to 2020, development of these vaccines against emerging pathogens wasn't something that was moving very quickly. As another one, uh, Lassa virus, again in West Africa, this is found in the, these multi-mammate mice, they get into people's houses, they spread the virus around and people get infected. And you can see this zone all across West Africa where we see the cases and again, no vaccine. And we're starting to use Chalux-1 to develop a vaccine against Lassa as well. Uh, and we've tested that in guinea pigs, which are the animal model for Lassa infections. And again, the um, animals that have received um, either one or two doses of the vaccine and then get exposed to Lassa virus, they survive. The ones that get the control vaccine, they also succumb to infection. So we know that at least in the animals, these are effective vaccines. We need to get them through manufacturing in preparation for clinical trials and then move into clinical development. I'd also been working on a vaccine against Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. This is one that's um, the source of zoonotic infections in the Middle East is camels. Um, that hasn't always been the case. It's likely that bats in Africa uh, were the original source of infection and infected some camels in Africa, which were then traded into the Middle East maybe about 50 years ago. And this virus has now spread around the camels in the Middle East. So it's, very, it's a very common infection in camels there now, particularly in Saudi Arabia. And this can lead to um, infections in people. And in young, healthy people, it's really quite a mild disease. It's just a cold. It doesn't cause them any problems, but it causes severe disease in people with compromised immune systems. And there have been quite a number of hospital outbreaks where somebody with a MERS infection has gone to hospital and the virus has spread and large numbers of people have been infected. This also happened um, in South Korea where there was an outbreak that involved several hospitals and the healthcare workers were becoming infected but uh, were not themselves seriously ill, although were able to then transmit the infection to patients in another hospital in one case. So this is also um, a priority disease for vaccine development um, as defined by the WHO. And we've been working on a vaccine against MERS coronavirus using the spike protein, the major surface antigen. And we've been testing this in clinical studies um, for a couple of years. Uh, we also have been testing it in camels in a small way uh, because it would be beneficial as with immunizing the horses against Hendra in Australia. If we can immunize the camels um, in Saudi Arabia against MERS, then we stop it spreading um, into the humans that come into contact with the camels. But the fact that this was another coronavirus um, and we were using the spike protein meant that when we saw that um, there was an outbreak of SARS-like pneumonia in, in China in the beginning of 2020, um, it meant that we knew how to make a vaccine against the virus that then became known as SARS-CoV-2 because we'd already done it for MERS and we'd already started clinical trials and we'd been measuring immune responses in those clinical trials. We knew that the vaccine was safe. We got good antibody responses. We got good T cell responses. 
we tested it in a, in a second study in Saudi Arabia, and that was going well. So we were able to draw on all of this knowledge when we found that there was a new coronavirus causing infections in people um, and that we needed to make a vaccine. Now, with my team, I had been planning for what the WHO called disease X, which is the unknown virus that's out there, the, the one that was um, at some point going to cause outbreaks cause pandemics, although to be honest, we were thinking more in terms of outbreaks rather than a pandemic with a new virus in our planning. And we've been thinking about how to make the very early parts of that development go really quickly so that we could very rapidly move into clinical development um, and then expand the clinical development until we had a vaccine that was licensed and, and ready to use around the world. So we'd been thinking about how to prepare for this, but we hadn't really done all the preparation that we wanted to do. We hadn't um, got everything optimized and timelines reduced as much as we would like to have had. But in 2020, um, the disease was there and we had to decide if we were going to respond to it and we decided that we would. So as the, um, the first cases outside mainland China were being found and the global emergency was declared and the number of cases were growing, we were working on our vaccine development in the lab. As soon as the genetic sequence became available from China, we made our vaccine. Uh, we started testing it in animals. We took it into our manufacturing facility. That's the, the GMP. That's good manufacturing practice vaccine, which we need to go into clinical trials. We got some early um, immune responses from the mice and then the monkeys that we'd immunized. And by the 23rd of April, we had safety data from animals. We had the vaccine manufactured, tested, fully approved for the clinical trial. And we started our clinical trial on the 23rd of April. Um, so these are some of the, the vaccine vials for that first clinical study. This is in, the, in our manufacturing facility where they're made, this is what it ends up looking like. Uh, and this is one of our earlier volunteers being vaccinated in the clinical trial. And from our volunteers, we ask them to come and see us lots of times and we take blood samples from them, which are processed in the lab. And we end up doing lots of immunoassays to measure their antibody responses and their T cell responses to the vaccine that they've received. And we measure the side effects of the vaccine and we ask them to record everything that's happening to them and tell us about it so that we monitor the vaccine safety. And we moved rapidly and by July of last year, we had a phase one clinical trial with 1,077 participants that half of them had received our vaccine, half of them received a meningitis vaccine. And we did this so that um, rather than using a saline placebo, um, this meningitis vaccine causes some reactions after vaccination as well. So our volunteers really wouldn't know which vaccine they'd had. Whereas if they'd received saline, um, they might have guessed that they didn't really get the um, coronavirus vaccine. We had a small group that got two doses of the vaccine as well. The vaccine had the expected adverse events after vaccination. Um, we knew that there would be some, we knew what to expect and it behaved as expected. There were no serious adverse events. And actually when we gave the second dose, there was a bit less reaction to the vaccine. And we need to measure the immune responses after vaccination. So what we're looking at here in blue is the antibody responses against the coronavirus in people who got the meningitis vaccine. So we can see that some of them had antibodies before we immunize them. They'd obviously already been exposed to the virus, but their antibodies don't change over time. They're, if they're low, they stay low. If they're high, then they stay high. That's what we'd expect because we haven't given the coronavirus vaccine to them. If we give people the Chalux 1 and COV-19, we see a spread of responses before we vaccinate them, but then we see all of these responses increasing in the days following vaccination. So we're getting induction of antibodies that recognize the coronavirus spike protein. If we give them two doses, which we did just in a very small group originally, that antibody response gets stronger. And this led to us deciding, as we didn't know how strong the antibody responses needed to be to protect people against this virus, we decided we would give two doses to all of the volunteers in our trial. Um, and this is just comparing the antibody responses to people who've been infected and, re and recovered. And the people in the dark green squares are the ones who had a severe infection. So if you have a severe COVID infection, you're more likely to end up with a high antibody titer than if you have a mild or an asymptomatic uh, infection. 
and we measured neutralizing antibodies, the type of antibodies that can bind to the virus and stop it infecting cells. So there's a lot of focus on these. This isn't necessarily the only way that the vaccine induces an immune response to protect us, but it's something that everybody's very keen to measure. And we saw that we did get neutralizing antibodies with one dose, but they get stronger when we give two doses. So again, supporting the decision to go for two doses of the vaccine in our trials. And again, if we look at neutralizing antibodies in people who've had either a symptomatic or an asymptomatic infection, after two doses, we're in the same ballpark as those antibody responses. So it's, it's quite likely that these responses will be protective, but we don't know that. We can just um, compare to what's there. We, what we really need to do is a phase three trial to see who's protected against the vaccine, uh, sorry, against the virus when they get exposed to it in real life. Another component of the immune response is, is T cell responses. We measure those as well. Again, no change if you have the meningitis vaccine, they increase if you have the coronavirus vaccine as we would have expected. So we had our phase one trial and we saw that the, the reactions to vaccination were as we'd expected, both in terms of side effects and immune responses in this group of young and very healthy people. We need to expand the trials. We moved into our phase two trial in the UK with older age groups. Uh, we moved into the phase three trial in adults 18 years and over in the UK. Uh, we started trials in Brazil and in South Africa. And when we licensed the vaccine to AstraZeneca, they started a phase three trial in the US. Um, and most of the participants in the trials received two doses. Now, what we're trying to do with the phase three trial is get the data that enables us to put before the regulators and ask for approval to use this vaccine. Um, and for that, we need to show that the vaccine actually works. So we need efficacy data from one or more phase three trials. We need vaccine safety and immunogenicity data from all the relevant populations. That means testing it in more than one country because you can have differences in immune response in different populations. Um, it means testing it in different age groups. And to begin with, we tested it in older people, but more recently we've started testing it in children, in adolescents so far. In people who are infected with HIV, uh, there are different population. We need to check uh, the risk benefit profile of that vaccine for use in people living with HIV. And in future, we will be testing the vaccine in pregnant women, which haven't yet been included in clinical trials. And when we have the efficacy data and the safety data in sufficient quantity, we can put that before the regulators and ask for approval for emergency use of the vaccine. So what we're measuring when we're talking about vaccine efficacy, in this case, is symptomatic PCR positive COVID-19. So we ask all of our volunteers in the trials who don't know whether they've had the COVID vaccine or the meningitis vaccine, if they get symptoms of COVID to contact us, to come to be tested and to see if, to have a PCR test, to see if they genuinely do have a COVID infection. And the analysis of efficacy is then carried out on people who didn't have antibodies when they joined the trial, didn't have a PCR positive results before they joined the trial, um, and had more than 15 days follow up after their second dose of the vaccine. So that meant that our first efficacy readout could only come from the UK and Brazil trials because there were not sufficient numbers in the South African trial to contribute to this because we have to have at least five cases from each country. And this was our first efficacy analysis, which is a table with lots of different numbers in it, and it is quite confusing. Um, so what we're looking at here is the overall efficacy amongst all the uh, participants in the trial was deemed to be 70.4%. So your risk of being infected if you'd been vaccinated was 70% lower than if you hadn't. But when we looked at different groups in the trial, we saw different numbers. So the people who'd had a, a low dose first and then a high dose actually had a much higher rate of efficacy. And the people who'd had two standard doses had a lower rate um, at only 60%. And when we take all of these together, we end up with a 70%. What we subsequently discovered that it wasn't actually the half dose first that was responsible for this efficacy. What had happened was that the people who were in this group tended to have a much longer period between the two vaccinations and the people who'd had two standard doses, which were four weeks apart. And we now have data showing, and I'll show you another slide in a minute, that it's actually the length of time between the two doses that increases the efficacy. But when we first analyzed the data, we were obliged to report it immediately. And so this is what was first reported. 
And when we um, put our manufacturing authorization application in front of the medicines and healthcare uh, regulatory authority, the regulators in the UK, what they decided to license was two standard doses. They said there would be protection starting from 21 days after the first dose. They acknowledged there were no hospitalizations or severe disease cases from 21 days after the first dose. And the vaccine was licensed for an interval between the doses of either of between four and 12 weeks, but they acknowledged that a longer interval may result in better efficacy. Um, and we saw similar results uh, in people who had various comorbidities, things like type 2 diabetes, and in older adults, particularly in terms of their immune response. And the vaccine was also safe in those groups. So the, the policy uh, that was decided for the UK rollout, and this is Professor Andrew Pollard receiving his vaccine on the first day of the vaccine rollout. He's the chief investigator for our clinical trials and has done a huge amount of work in the last year on this vaccine and its clinical development. Um, the, the JCVI recommended two doses to be given three months apart. And the reason for giving them three months apart, 12 weeks apart, is that the antibody response is higher with the second dose. Um, and that increases if the gap between the two doses is left for longer. And we were seeing already a trend to higher efficacy when the second dose was given later. But there was protection of around 70% from three weeks after the first dose. So it makes sense to give a first dose to people they get around 70% protection and then three months later give them the second dose and we would expect that protection to increase. We then um, got some more data from the clinical trials over time and in February we were able to publish an update and this supported the use of the single dose vaccination initially and the second dose at 12 weeks. So in this study we were able to look at the vaccine efficacy from the different times after the first standard dose. And we saw that we got into the 70% um, within from 22 days after the first vaccination. That stayed uh, in the 70% level up to 60 days and up to 90 days. So the recommendation is to give the second vaccination at 84 days. Uh, and between 22 and 90 days across these groups, vaccine efficacy is 76%. So very good efficacy from one dose. And we then showed that after the second dose, vaccine efficacy increased um, from the interval between the first and second doses being six weeks to six to eight weeks to um, nine to 11 weeks or 12 weeks or more. So increasing efficacy with increasing time between the first and second dose, again, supporting uh, the recommendation of the JCVI. But now, we're starting to see what's called vaccine effectiveness data. So in a clinical trial, we measure efficacy. Uh, we vaccinate some people and not others. We measure them very carefully. Uh, but in the real world, uh, we are now starting to see millions of people vaccinated. And we can see how effective this vaccine is when it's used in the people that we most need to protect. And this is really very exciting data because in England, in the people aged over 70 who've received one dose, from 28 days uh, after infection, at least, there is at least 60% protection against symptomatic PCR positive disease. So this is mild disease. In the over 80s, hospitalization is reduced by 80%, again, after one dose. So this is obviously disease that's severe enough that needs you to go into hospital. And what's been seen so far with the Pfizer vaccine is that these numbers are very similar, uh, but because that vaccine's been in use for slightly longer, um, we can now see that there's an even greater protection against mortality in the over 70s after a single dose of the Pfizer vaccine. We need a few more weeks data before we can assess this with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which hasn't been in use for so long. But this is real world data. This is um, a study, and there are others now that back it up, a second one from England and another from Scotland, showing that a single dose of the vaccine in older adults is giving very good protection against um, this disease. And the vaccine is now licensed, for, has regulatory approval in many different countries around the world. Um, it has approval across the EU and in all of these different countries, um, it's approved for use by various different mechanisms. So um, the regulators have agreed to use it in these countries and many of the other countries are covered by the WHO approval. AstraZeneca have also set up um, manufacturing supply chains around the world. We started first in the UK 
Um, and over time, they've set up partnerships with companies like the Serum Institute of India that are making very large numbers of doses with SK Bio in um, South Korea and R Farm in Russia. They are working with manufacturers such as Via Cruz in Brazil, uh, who are at the moment uh, doing the work of putting vaccine into vials to use in Brazil, but in future will do manufacturing. CSL in Australia are now um, taking over manufacturing of the vaccine to be used in Australia. And this approach of having multiple manufacturers in different parts of the world means that we should be able to see supply going to the different parts of the world with local manufacturing. This has been an enormous amount of work to set that up. Um, but this is what we need if we're going to have broad and equitable access. We can't make all the doses in the UK, Europe and the US and hope to supply everywhere. We need to work with manufacturers around the world to achieve that. And we're now seeing the first vaccinations under the COVAX scheme um, of our vaccine. This is just the 1st of March. This is the first vaccination given in, in the Ivory Coast, now being used in Ghana, in Nigeria, through this vaccine sharing screen, um, scheme. Uh, and this is mainly Serum Institute vaccine, but also um, a vaccine manufactured in South Korea that's going um, into these different countries under the WHO approval. So I'm not going to name individual people to acknowledge um, who've worked on this journey because there are really so very many large numbers of them. I just wanted to call out a few of the different types of people that have been necessary to get this whole program started moving and reaching um, where we are now. And I won't say it's conclusion because we still have more work to do. But most of all, I want to thank the volunteers in our clinical trials, because without people coming forward, being willing to test um, vaccines, we're never going to be able to develop vaccines. And we are enormously grateful to them uh, for their understanding and their patience, and they're willing to donate blood on multiple different occasions so that we can check what's happening. So I'll stop there and um, take any questions that you may have. Sarah, what can I say? I just in awe of, of the work that's gone on. And um, well, I've got a couple of questions to ask and then I'm going to start using the ones that um, people are submitting. You talked about the fact that you'd been working on this idea of disease X for a while. Um, and I was reading that on New Year's Day, you know, you, you became aware of you know, what was going on in Wuhan. But I'm still struck by how fast the decision was made by your team to absolutely go for developing a vaccine. Um, and I, I just wonder how difficult a decision that was to, to kind of press go on a project this big. It was, that? it was a little bit difficult because we, as I said, we didn't feel that we were fully prepared. We, we'd had some plans that we wanted to work on. We hadn't been able to, to put them into place. We hadn't been funded to, to do the work that we wanted to do. So we knew we had a technology that was suitable, but we hadn't done all the optimization to, to really cut out any unnecessary time in the early vaccine development. But then we had a few days to decide, are we doing this or not? Because what we did know was that if you're going to go, you have to start straight away. As soon as the sequence was available and we were waiting for that, we would start the vaccine development. But I knew from thinking back to what happened in Ebola, we thought we did a great job there with the early clinical development. And there we didn't have to do the vaccine manufacturing, the very early development, the testing in animals, that had already been done. The vaccine had been manufactured. Our job was to help get it put into the vaccine vials and tested, and then do the clinical trial and get it to West Africa so that it could go into a phase three trial. And we did our part of that very quickly. Uh, and the early part had already been done. So it was, it was not a particularly difficult thing for us to have to do, but then it just stopped. Um, and things, you know, people needed to work out how to move to the next stage, who's going to work with who, what was going to happen. Um, and so that was in our minds when we were thinking about this uh, vaccine project. If you're going to achieve anything, you have to plan all the way to the end of the project, all the way through to vaccine licensure at a very early stage. And that was the part that was really most challenging. Um, it wasn't that we hadn't done all of these things before but we now had to do them all at the same time. And we had to think about who was going to manufacture this vaccine and who was going to do the commercial supply to get it around the world. We needed a partner and we needed um, a manufacturing process that we could transfer to that partner. And we had to work on that at the same time as we were working on the, uh, the animal studies and writing the application for the clinical trial. So everything was happening at the same time. And that was what was really very challenging. 
And obviously, the, the pandemic was developing very fast. Politically, there was a lot of issues and tensions around it and the way different countries were handling it. Were there any points, once you embarked on the process of developing this vaccine, of real difficulty, of whether it was major disagreement or anxiety about is this going to go the way we need? Because obviously, I know the British government did absolutely back it, you know, early on at a key stage. But I'm interested in was there a point where it was worrying about how you would proceed? In in the first in few months, um, it was really difficult to to get this moving at, at the speed that we needed to because I think we had to, you know, we're a university and universities don't make and sell vaccines, um, and we had to find a partner to work with, and it was difficult to persuade people that we really could do this, that we really could do the early work ourselves and then work with a partner, which turned out to be AstraZeneca, to take over the vaccine manufacturing and to take over the eventual supply of the vaccine. And we were trying to convince people that this was possible, we could make it work while we were trying to do the work. So again, it was just doing everything at the same time. By the time we got to about May, we had UK government funding, we had a partner in AstraZeneca, and from then on, um, it was still an awful lot of work to do, but we knew we had everything in place then uh, to, to move on with the project. Um, I'm going to stop taking some of the many terrific questions that are coming in. So Andrew Barrow asked, why did SARS and MERS not become pandemics in the way that COVID-19 has? Well, I think they're not as transmissible between humans. Uh, we've seen now, particularly with uh, the UK variant that arose uh, of SARS-CoV-2, it, it spreads very, very easily between people. That's not really the case with the first SARS virus. With the first, with SARS-CoV-1, um, people didn't transmit the virus until they already had symptoms. So it's possible to know that you're infected and quarantine um, before infecting anybody else. That made control a lot easier, whereas with SARS-CoV-2, we know that people get asymptomatic infections and can still infect other people. That makes it a lot harder. With MERS, um, I, it could change, it could adapt. If you have enough infections in humans with the coronavirus, it probably will adapt. Um, so we really need to try and keep the lid on MERS so that it doesn't go the same way. Um, a follow-up question, I don't have a name with it. Will the COVID-19 experience get us ready for the next pandemic? Well, I really hope so. I think we've, we've learned a lot. We've seen some things that work well. Uh, we've seen that a consortia of um, groups working together can really achieve rapid vaccine development. Uh, within the UK, we'd already um, had the initiation of the Vaccines Manufacturing and Innovation Centre. So that's a research vaccine manufacturing facility, essentially, which was starting to be built. Sadly, it wasn't ready to use in time for the pandemic, but it will be, it, it will be ready by the end of 2021. So whereas we had a lot of problems last year, we made our own small batch of vaccine for the phase one trials, and then we needed to get the next lot of vaccine made to continue clinical development. That was a problem for us. If VMIC had been up and running, ready to manufacture, that would have made our lives a lot easier. So there are certain things like that that are being put into place that will help, but we still need to keep thinking about all the challenges, where we can save time um, and how we can make this work as efficiently as possible. Thank you. Uh, Laura Pacorni asks, why are bats so often the reservoir for zoonotic viruses? It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, bats have slightly odd immune systems and they, don't, they seem to tolerate um, infections with lots of different viruses. They, they get infected with rabies-like viruses as well. And it doesn't make them ill, um, but the, and the viruses are quite happy living there. Um, viruses don't uh, do well when they kill their host because then they've killed, the, they've killed the golden goose, if you like, but they seem to coexist quite easily with bats. Um, and there are lots of different viruses that we find in bats that then can start to infect other um, species and ultimately us. Do you think there is a reason to be concerned about you know, this claim that climate change and the kind of encroachment on uh, wildlife habitats is going to make pandemics of this kind more likely in future? Anything that increases contact between wildlife and humans is going to make um, zoonotic infections of this spillover. Um, more likely. And it doesn't need to happen very often. You know, in the Ebola outbreak of 2014, that was one person who got infected from a bat and uh, then it spread and killed um, many thousands. So 
if we have deforestation, um, humans encroaching into different areas, um, wildlife um, coming into contact with them more, this will happen more often. Thank you. Um, Christina Patterson raises a question, which I wanted to ask as well, but we put it her way first. Absolutely wonderful what you've done, first of all. I think a lot of people are commenting on that. What's the data currently showing about long COVID? And she says for those who've had two doses of the Oxford vaccine, but I think there's a real anxiety about the impact of long COVID in general. Do you have any observations about that? And yes, specifically how far the vaccine can affect that? Well, the vaccine will prevent infection um, so people who've been vaccinated aren't expected to get long COVID. I mean, there are, there are some infections in people who've been vaccinated. They tend to be very mild and they resolve very quickly. So I'm, I suppose we still need more data to see if anybody who's been vaccinated ever gets long COVID. But we would expect because we're uh, reducing infections to such mild disease, it's probably very unlikely to happen. If you've already got long COVID, um, the vaccine isn't going to help you most likely because um, what you're suffering from is not the viral infection itself, it's the after effects of that infection. Um, thank you. Uh, right, um, this is one from someone with the name HBs. Uh, thank you for such a fascinating lecture. I was wondering if the absence of any obvious reaction to the COVID-19 vaccine, such as chills, pain at the injection site, et cetera, signifies a lesser immune response, or if that's just perfectly normal. No, it doesn't. Uh, so the reactions after vaccination vary quite a lot between different people. And it doesn't mean that you're not making a good immune response if you don't have a reaction. It just, it's just um, you know, people are different. Um, some people don't really react at all um, and still make a very good immune response. Thank you. Um, your vaccine, so this is a question from Don Fuller, your vaccine is injected. What are the pros and cons of a nasal spray vaccine? So our vaccine is injected because uh, we needed to move quickly. We had data on using this type of vaccine by injection previously, and that was the only way to go fast. We are considering um, a formulation that might be different, that might uh, be a nasal spray or even a tablet form of the vaccine. These are things that will take some time to develop because we need to think about different formulations. We would also like the vaccine to be stable at ambient temperature so that we, at the moment it needs to be kept in a fridge. Even better if it didn't need to be kept in a fridge if you could just keep it at room temperature. So these are things that um, I actually had a meeting about just earlier on today about plans for developing this, but it's not something that we can do as quickly as we can intramuscular injection because we already knew how that would work. Thank you. And Nick Edwards raises a question, I think is on many people's minds right now. How concerned are you about um, viral variants? And especially in Brazil, where we're seeing the impact of one of the latest variants. Someone described it yeah. as being like an atomic bomb in terms of, yeah. of the casualties that are filling hospitals. And they yeah. seem to be developing quite fast. There's obviously a, a, a trade-off in time, isn't there, about how variants develop? So, I mean, there are a number of different variants. And, and the one that we're not worried about at all is the one that developed in the UK. So the B117 variant. The Kent one. The Kent one, yes, because the recent, well, the, the later efficacy data from our clinical trials and the recent effectiveness data that we're seeing, that's all with a lot of the, of the Kent virus around. And the vaccine's working very well against that. So we're not worried about that one. Um, the ones that in lab tests seem better able to um, avoid the antibodies that are induced either by vaccination or infection with the original virus, those are the South African variant in particular, possibly also the Brazil variant. So we started in December thinking about next generation of the vaccine. So it's a very adaptable technology. We just put in a different spike gene sequence and we can make a vaccine against the Brazil variant or the South African variant or the UK variant if we want to. Uh, and we started doing that. And we are starting to test those different variants of the vaccine to match the variants of the virus. And, and that will give us data that will help decide what we should move to next. So it doesn't necessarily mean that for every new variant, we have to have a new version of the vaccine because there's a lot of similarity between the mutations in Brazil and in South Africa. We're seeing the same changes crop up again. Um, so it may be that we have to have one new version of the vaccine, which then works against multiple different variants. But we also have to keep an eye on what's out there and what's coming next. Um, 
but we have seen that we get good protection um, against the Kent variant. Uh, in South Africa, our vaccine didn't protect so well against the South African variant in terms of mild disease, but we were only able to look at it um, in protection against mild disease because it was a young population that was being tested in and nobody in the control group got severe disease. So we can't say if our vaccine could have protected against severe disease. And what we know is that it's easier to protect against severe disease and hospitalization and death than it is to protect against mild disease. So we're optimistic that the vaccine would still protect against at least severe disease with many of these variants. Thank you. Um, Tim Waite asks, why is a small minority of people not benefiting from the vaccine? So when we're looking at the over 70s and the over 80s, uh, not everybody is being completely protected, although we do have a high degree of protection. Um, it's partly down to them. So uh, particularly if we're thinking about the, the care home population, the very frail elderly, their immune system is not really working well. It won't respond to a vaccine particularly well. Um, so that's not really a surprise. And there will be some older people whose immune systems are partially functioning and they don't make a very good immune response. So that's part of it. The level of exposure of virus that you get may have something to do with it as well. If you just get a very small amount of virus uh, causing your infection, it's going to take longer for the virus to spread um, and cause severe disease. And that gives your immune system longer to respond to it. So I think it's probably a combination of um, your level of exposure and your ability to make immune responses may be related to the variants as well in some cases. Um, we know that no vaccine is perfect. No vaccine will ever protect everybody who's vaccinated with it. But I think the vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine, as well as the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine are showing really high effectiveness in older people. And that's only going to improve when we start to see the data from younger people being vaccinated. Excellent. Um, there are concerns, this is another question, about a possible vector um, immunity uh, that could cause just mild body uh, response to the second jab compared to other vaccines, which show really a boost after the second jab. Are there issues about needing to change the vector? A couple of people are asking about this. So we measure um, antibody responses against the vector as well. And we've already shown, and we, we've published this, uh, that the level of antibody response against the vector that you get from the first vaccination doesn't affect the ability to make the immune response to the second vaccination. And the people with the stronger anti adenovirus antibodies don't make less of response to the coronavirus spike protein. Um, when people get infected with a, a, a human adenovirus, that's quite, uh, that's an infection that spreads through the body, through the respiratory tract. The immune system has to respond to control that adenovirus infection, and you're left with antibodies against that human adenovirus. What we're doing is very different. We're injecting into the muscle um, one dose or then two doses of uh, an adenovirus that can't spread. So the body doesn't need to make an antibody response against the vector because it's there for a few days and then it's gone. So the level of antibodies that we get against vaccination are very different from the level of antibodies that you get when you've been naturally infected with an adenovirus. And although there, there is some, it doesn't really seem to have any impact on the immune response in the way that we're using the vaccine. If we were to revaccinate people every four weeks, we would start to see a problem probably, but uh, nobody's proposing that we would do that. Thank you. Uh, Jane Yates asks, thank you so much for such an informative lecture. How easy was it to work collaboratively with the global community towards an equitable rollout worldwide? Um, well, working with the global community on the vaccine trials was um, something that everybody wanted to do. Uh, we worked with partners that we've worked with previously. It's really important to work with clinical trialists in other parts of the world who know what they're doing that, are, that can deliver high quality trials. And, and that's exactly what we did here. To work with um, partners for the equitable rollout is quite complicated. It's a technical manufacturing process. Um, and it's taken a lot of support from AstraZeneca to all of the different manufacturing organizations to bring them all to the point where they're making exactly the same vaccine derived from the same starting uh, materials that we provide to the same process testing it in the same way and getting the same yields that um, everybody gets. And it, it does take a while for the new manufacturers to really get this process working extremely well in their own facilities. 
And what that means is that when a new manufacturer starts, the yield of the vaccine that they get, the number of doses they get per batch probably isn't very good at the beginning. And then as with many things, with practice, um, with just uh, more support, they get better, the yields improve. So it's quite a, a big undertaking to support all of these different companies to manufacture the same vaccine to the same specifications and get the same yield. So that's taken a, a really huge amount of effort. And Paul Kaufman asks, how does the potency of COVID-19 compare with the so-called Spanish flu epidemic, which was so devastating after the uh, First World War and killed 50 million people worldwide? Or so. so the potency, I suppose, what that would mean would be the fatality rate. I'm not sure we were agreed on what the fatality rate for SARS-CoV-2 is now, and it's probably changed with the variants that are, that are out there. Uh, in the Spanish flu, that only killed about... Um, one to two percent of the people infected but because it affected infected virtually everybody around the world within the space of a few years there were uh, tens of millions of, of, of hundreds of millions of deaths from that um, so you don't have to have a highly fatal virus to cause a very large numbers of deaths when the virus spreads and infects everybody right question that a couple of people are asking um both um Ruth Silverstone and Jeremy McEwen, thank you for what you and your team are doing. Will we need to have annual jabs for the foreseeable future? Well, we, we don't know for certain yet because we need to keep measuring people's immune responses over time. And we are doing that with the, the volunteers who were first in our trials where they're coming back to us after six months and then they'll come back after a year and we'll see how their immune response has changed. But we did that with the MERS vaccine that we'd worked on previously. And we saw that a year after vaccination, they still had very good immune responses. So my expectation is that at least in younger adults, we won't need to revaccinate every year. And I also think that the vaccines, because the variants are not changing very much, we won't need to keep revaccinating because we've got different variants out there because the variants are really quite similar to one another. Um, but it may be that in older people who are more susceptible to severe disease and don't have such strong immune systems, we may need to vaccinate them more frequently. So we could end up with a situation where once everybody's, once all the adults have been vaccinated with two doses, um, younger people don't need another dose for several years, but older people, maybe the 70 plus population, we would be looking to vaccinate more frequently. Right. Uh, again, a question that a few people are asking, but I'll ask Jill McLaughlin's version. Um, does the second dose have to be with the same brand of vaccine? So the whole mix and match issue? Well, in theory, absolutely not. I mean, um, we've done lots of work um, in the Jenner Institute on what we call heterologous prime boost immunisation. So using one vaccine of one type and a second vaccine of another, and that often works extremely well. Um, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, that needs to be tested. And there are trials going on now with the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer vaccine, giving either one first and then the opposite one second. That's partly just to look at the safety of that approach, uh, because it's, it's possible that with so many people being vaccinated now, uh, when people come back for their second vaccination, it might be the case that the one that they had the first time around isn't available on that day. And so we want to know, would it be a good thing to do to give them whichever vaccine we do have in the clinic or should they really wait to have the same one again so that's being tested and there's no reason why it wouldn't be safe but it's formally being tested now and it may result in even better immune responses so we'll we'll see that when we get the clinical trial data thank you um jagdev panisar asks you mentioned that you have to supply something to all of the labs which are manufacturing the vaccine what is in this starter kit well, there's, there's quite a lot, actually. So um, to make the vaccine, first of all, we need the cells, the special cell line, uh, which is derived from a, a human cell that we manufacture the vaccine on. It has some other changes made to it. Uh, and that's produced. Those cells are grown in quantity. And so there's what's called a master cell bank. And then from that, you develop the working cell bank. And then you supply these frozen cells to all the different manufacturers. And then we need to supply the stocks of the Chalux 1 and COVID-19 virus itself, um, which are then used to infect the, the cells and the virus replicates, it makes more copies of itself. So it's only in this particular cell line that the virus can make more copies of itself. It doesn't do that when we use it to vaccinate. And then when you've got lots of the virus made inside the cells, then you have to purify it. 
So we have to transfer all of the information about how to grow the cells, how to infect them, how to purify the virus from the cells, and then how to test it. And there are lots of tests that have to be done before you can um, use a vaccine in people. And those tests have to be done in a very standardized way. And you sometimes need um, reagents, chemicals, things that you use in those tests or that you use to understand if the test's working properly. So there's a whole package of information that goes alongside the cells and the virus that you need for the manufacturing. Thank you. And Michael Carrington raises a question that, again, others are asking, when will we have an indisputable statement regarding the cause, the origin of the virus, do you think? I don't know that we ever will, and I don't know that it necessarily matters. It's, it's all the way around the world now, and we need to protect against it. Um, because one of the things that I read was that uh, a researcher in Wuhan did send the, um, the sort of genetic profile very early on to one of your colleagues. Am I right? Well, so it, that... wasn't, it wasn't directly to us. It was it was made publicly available uh, on a on a server that uh, people all around the world could access, and we were able to access it as well. Right. Um, but obviously, you know, huge amount of collaboration from concerned Chinese colleagues trying to yes. to get the world to to work on this. Um, thank you. Um, right. Let's have a quick look at so many questions coming in, guys. These are all brilliant. Um, oh, here's a good one. Paul Milner says, anything more been discovered about the apparently different susceptibility to the virus in minority ethnic populations? It's causing a lot of anxiety. Yeah. Um, so, well, I'm, I'm, my job is to is to develop the vaccine and, and get everybody protected. And we've, we've tested the vaccine in, in minority ethnic populations and we know that it's safe and we know that it um, gives very good immune responses. And there's more and more data coming about um, efficacy and effectiveness of the vaccine as well. So that's what um, I need to be looking at. So the reason um, people, different groups can be more susceptible is either down to genetics or it can be down to other things, uh, microorganisms in the environment. But if we're talking about people who are all living in the same country, then it's, it's largely down to genetics. People have just inherited different genes. And that goes back through history. So um, if you're descended from somebody who was living in Europe in the time of plague, you will have been, your genes will have been selected to be more resistant to plague because you would have survived, more likely to survive if you have the genes that mean you get through plague. Uh, if you were living, uh, descended uh, from somebody who was not living in Europe at that time, you might have been through, or your ancestors would have been through different selective pressures. And so we all are products of our genes, which have been selected by our environment um, through our ancestors over decades and hundreds of years. So um, the diseases that were causing large numbers of deaths in the past where people were living shapes our genetics today, and that can then affect our immune response to those diseases now. Thank you. Uh, Richard asks, after all the adult population has been vaccinated twice, which seems really likely in, in somewhere like the UK, will we be approaching herd immunity? Well, we also need to, if we really want herd immunity, we would need to vaccinate children as well. What's your view um, on that? Because that's also a question being raised about. Yeah. So at the moment, there are clinical trials, not just with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, but with other vaccines as well. They're being tested in teenagers uh, and they will in future be tested in younger children. That's for a, a couple of different reasons. So there are some children that are particularly susceptible to um, infection that, that really would benefit from vaccination. So we need to get the data to allow that to happen. Um, but then there's a question of whether we use it more widely. And we know that for flu, if you vaccinate toddlers against flu, it not only protects them, it greatly reduces the number of flu infections that happen in that whole community. And now this doesn't seem to be such an issue for COVID, for SARS-CoV-2, but it's true that we will still have circulation among children if they're not being vaccinated. So it's going to be a complicated decision. Those children would normally be getting infected with seasonal coronaviruses. There are four other coronaviruses that infect us and cause colds, but they can cause severe disease and death in, in very old people, um, the care home population. Um, this is a new coronavirus that we haven't had circulating before, so we haven't got immunity to. With the ones that have been circulating for a while, kids get infected, they have a cold, they get better, adults might get reinfected. And because that immunity builds up over life, 
it's not until you get to the very late stage of life and maybe the immune system's not working again that those coronaviruses are dangerous. Now, if we want to get to that stage with SARS-CoV-2, we have to think about how that immunity is going to be built up. And it could be built up by vaccination. It could, in theory, also be built up by infections in the children who are not particularly at risk. But that will allow the virus to continue to circulate and people who are at risk could then continue to be exposed. So it's a, it's a complex decision to make. For the moment, we're concentrating on getting the vaccine safety and immune response data to allow that kind of decision to be made by, by others. Thank you. I want to try and fit in three more questions if I can. Uh, Alan Cutler asks, how does obesity affect the situation? How does it affect, sorry? The situation, the whole issue. Okay. So, well, we've heard uh, recently that in countries yeah. where uh, the people are much more susceptible to severe disease from COVID uh, if they are obese. Um, there's a general kind of inflammation that goes along with, inf in, uh, with obesity. And so, yeah, it's not the good thing to be obese if you're going to be infected with this virus. Um, thank you. Um, an anonymous one. As a clinician involved in vaccination, I despair that people are being fed what I see as mischievous data, making them ask for one vaccine over another. I see the vaccines as more or less equivalent and that these people are being misinformed for political and commercial reasons. I know you have well, in theory vested interest, he asks, but or she asks, but do you agree? Are you I've concerned? always said that people should take the vaccine that they're offered. The best vaccine to have is the vaccine that you're being offered. I mean, we now have data that shows there's no, you can't choose between the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, that's, that's quite clear. They're both working extremely well. And um, what we need is to get everybody vaccinated as quickly as possible. So people should be taking a vaccine as soon as they're offered it. Thank you. And Susan, I think this might have to be the last question. How easily have you managed to focus completely on your vital work and ignore all the politics around vaccination in the background? Um, well, it's not always easy, but I just don't read the news some days if, if there's some new row going on. There's, there's always loads to do um, in the lab uh, working on the vaccine programme. So sometimes we just get on with, with doing the work and, and leave the politics to somebody else. Fair enough. Actually, I'm going to sneak in this one from Tony F. Thank you, Sarah. Um, today on Radio 4 PM during an interview, you said a worry was whether people would continue doing what they need to do or would behave as if everything was OK. Could you expand on that? Well, what we don't want to happen is that with the success we've had of the vaccine rollout so far, and we're seeing um, a rapid drop off in case numbers and decrease in deaths, decrease in hospitalizations. We don't want people to think that's it. It's all fine. We can go back to normal now, because if everybody stops following the guidelines now, before we have um, a lot of the population vaccinated, we will see a big uptick in transmission. We'll see hospitalizations um, increasing again. And we also lay ourselves open to more variants forming. So we need to you know, stick with the plan for now. As the vaccine rollout continues, gradually open up society and not just declare that um, it's all fine and we can go back to normal living because we haven't finished the job yet. No, it, in a sense, it's a more dangerous time when we think that things are definitely, you know, there's a solution out there, but it, we're not there yet. Um, I, I, I mean, could, we could go on talking forever, but you need a break. And um, I think you've answered so many terrific questions. So um, thank you. Um, every year, I feel uh, the speakers who give the Rosalind Franklin Medal, you know, all have something important to celebrate. Um, but I think tonight, when we're all not even in the, the room together because of COVID, I have particular pleasure and honour, quite frankly, in, in being the one to get to, to field questions for you. Now, at this time, I would normally be presenting Sarah with the Rosalind Franklin Medal. However, as you may have worked out, there are a couple of somewhat insurmountable problems on this occasion. The first one you can guess, which is we can't all be together, we're all separate, so I can't physically present Sarah with her medal as I normally would at the lecture. But the second problem, which you may have guessed, um, or probably not know, a software bug at the engraver's workshop has meant that the medal does not yet in fact exist with the engraving on it. Uh, we only sadly became aware of this this week, but I think we have an image of the medal, which uh, people can see. So it will, it will exist. <laughs> you will get it um and i'm sure that sarah you will be receiving it in person next week and we hope that we might have a photograph or something that we could share um with everyone who's uh, been following your achievements and um has been following the rosalind franklin lecture so in the meantime we're sharing the artist's impression um and it is still my pleasure even in this weird non-physical way to award sarah 
um, Professor Sarah Gilbert the Roslyn Franklin Medal for her careful, diligent, life-saving work in creating the vaccine and her ongoing public science communication work, both educating and reassuring the public at this time. If I may ask Sarah, I know it's a really journalistic thing, but looking back on what's happened over the past year, how do you feel? Well, there hasn't really been much time to think about that because we're still going. We're still working every day. Uh, we're still thinking about what we need to do. And, and um, I th it's, it's absolutely wonderful to see the vaccine being used now in so many countries around the world um, and seeing that it really is saving lives in the countries where we've used it most. So it, it's great. But I think it, you know, it's going to take a while for it all to sink in. Yeah, no, it, it is. Um, well, thank you. That's such an inadequate word. Um, congratulations again. Um, thank you for sparing the time to talk to us. Thank you to everyone from around the world who took part in this event for submitting your questions for, for being here. Um, and thank you to Humanists UK um, for organising the Rosalind Franklin Lecture. Good evening. Thank you.